What advice would you have for beginners starting out? My advice is don't be scared to copy because that's how you learn. Copy, learn, try it and, and learn as many different styles of music as you can as well. I mean, I used to love all the styles. I, I liked the punk stuff, I liked the indie stuff, I liked I like everything, reggae, classical, you know, obviously when I was in the orchestra, that's all they played was classical. Um, so yeah, is to learn, learn as much as you can. Don't be afraid to make mistakes because you can't always be perfect, even though you want to be, you know, you, you're always going to make, and sometimes the mistakes are a learning thing, so you don't make mistakes later on down the line. Put yourself in positions that you're not used to. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good, that's really good. I, I, I always wanted to be in a safe, safe like situation, but it's better when, especially when you're first starting and you're young, just, just do things you're not used to. You know, that's, and then it will, it will help you look along the line. I think my advice would be, it sounds very typical, but really do what sets you ablaze, like what makes you very interested, uh, the, the frequencies and sounds that really resonate with you. Um, because then we'll have the most interesting and original results. And the chances of you being the only person in the world who likes the frequencies you like, are, I think, are quite remote. So there will be people out there who will understand what you're doing. So I'd really pursue what you find most interesting. And always explore and ask questions and try new music. Right. As, even as you're practicing your instrument, always listen to things outside your, your usual field of interest. I think that's a really helpful thing to do. I think every guitarist who gets anywhere to any kind of level with it for themselves or as a job or whatever has spent at some point being quite obsessed with it and um, I still play, although I've been playing you know, 40 something years, it's probably 50 years now, nearly 50 years, um, I still spend two or three hours a day if I can just playing for no other reason than to handle the instrument and try and learn something new every day and try and break a barrier or do something. And I think that's what it is, it's just to be obsessed with it. These days it's more difficult than ever because kids have such amazing computer games and, and, uh, and stuff and they're very absorbing, their attention gets very absorbed into that. Yeah. And that's the kind of, it's a kind of, although it's interactive, it's nothing like as interactive as learning an instrument. Learning an instrument is a real hard slog at first to, to make anything good out of it. And, uh, so that's what the advice I would give to beginners is try and develop the kind of passion that draws you towards it for a couple of hours a day, for a few years. And then at a certain point, you, it becomes much easier. So it's patience. It's don't expect to be able to run before you can walk. It takes time. You've got to build up that confidence. You've got to build up your finger strength. So, I mean, your fingers aren't designed to do all that straight away and, and the reach yeah some people you know I've got quite a big reach some people can't span an octave so you know, you know they're not going to play man enough because you need an octave and a third sometimes even but um, patience it does get easier but not quickly <laughs> it's really difficult to play as an instrument mm -hmm. and you know you've got to learn to work this arm up in the air and it's you've got a slow kind of thing. That it's like physically, real... it's kind of really cack-handed and yeah. a bit clumsy. You know, the cello's really kind of gravity, it goes with gravity and everything, but, mm -hmm. but the violin is, you really do have to learn and then you have to learn how to relax in those positions. Mm -hmm. So it's awkward. Yeah. And a lot of young kids get stuck on the awkwardness yeah. and the teacher's trying to train them and give them the bow hold and then the work on the fingering and it, it's like you forget how to, you forget about the essence which is the sound and the music that you're making and people forget about tuning and they forget about the sound mm -hmm. and of course that's what most people remember about their kids learning to play the violin yeah. <laughs> it's, the sound, it's the sound and the tuning you know yeah. and it can take two to three years for that to get to set in but not if you start from the beginning well, first and foremost, I think it's about being into uh, uh, wanting to learn it. That's number one. Number two, um, I would say when you're practicing and you're learning, try and learn something that you're really into rather than, I, I, I think it's a drag if you're just going on technique and everything. I think you have to be passionate about it from a very young age. You go from there. Well, like we do, do courses with young 
kids and um, you know you try and give them different genres to, to, to experiment with you know you, there's certain bass players you know you've got to learn those bass lines or whatever um, but then I think it's really important to have a basic understanding of chords and as a bass player you know knowing your root notes and your major you know your fifth and major it's, it's absolutely important that you understand that part um, and then the other thing is is to practice to a groove you know, if you can. I mean, uh, uh, that's something I didn't do earlier on. I used to, I found that if, with drummers, they go, well, sometimes I push it, pu push it too much or whatever. And I realized that, you know, practicing to a groove, not necessarily a metronome, and I know metronomes, are, but to a groove, so you really just feel it, is, is just a, a really important thing to do from, from the off. So if you're 12, 11, 12, what I'd recommend, if you're at school and you're into bass, find someone who's a drummer and go and start playing with them. But you don't have to do that. You can be at home playing along to a, you know, to a record and, and with the groove. Just copy the record. Um, you know, with YouTube now, I, unbelievable because you can just slow. You can just get something, slow it right down. You'll have someone who's showing you how to play it really slowly, and you just follow it. And uh, so I still will for, for YouTube. I still go and check out certain bass players and, and for things. It's, it's a constant, you know. So yeah. And the advice I would give would be probably from the songwriting side rather than from a uh, musician side. Um, uh, and I would be, um, my advice would be that you need to really spend, put the hours in to learn your craft. Um, songwriting is, um, you know, something that, uh, you know, it's 10% uh, inspiration and it's 90% perspiration. And it's an old cliche, but it's true. Um, I was reading an article the other day, Neil Diamond, um, who's known more for his kind of uh, singing and performance, but he's, you know, a songwriter by trade. And, um, you know, he described it as digging ditches. You know, for him, it's, it's hard labour. It's digging ditches. It's they're, they're sort of internal ditches rather than, you know, physical work, but it is hard labour. It's the job that he chooses, the job he does, but it's it's something he has to put a lot of time and effort into and that would be that would be you know my advice to any songwriter would be to you know to to really work at your songs don't accept second best you know there's, there's 70 or 80 years of popular music history there's only a certain number of ways of putting melodies and chords together and that requires even more effort i think to make things interesting and more importantly beautiful um, and you know to, to get those sections of music that um, that, that people are drawn to um, and uh, highly listenable and, and move people. Um, so put the time in, put the effort in, work at it. If I gave myself advice, it'd be specific, probably. Yeah. It would probably be to, um, and it sounds a bit specific again, it would probably be to play bigger drums right. <laughs> earlier. We talked about the fact that some of my drum kits, when I was playing funk, was smaller sizes. But almost every engineer I've ever worked with of any good quality and most other good quality musicians I've worked with, they like drummers with bigger sounds, bigger drums that sound fatter and more musical. So I really didn't start looking at the musical side of things, although I think I did that naturally anyway until a lot later. I didn't start thinking about fat drum sounds or uh, concentrating really on the groove of things. Um, I mean, I do that a lot now, and I, I, I like to think at the time I was a groovy drummer. But I've realised what's important now, and the things that are most important, like we just said, yeah. was it feeling good and it grooving good and you being musical. What I'm far more interested in is the guitarist next to me, the MD, or the singer, or the bass player going, or the front of house sound guy going, that sounds wicked, that drum sounds great, that's grooving. It's much more important to me than, as nice as it is, to you know a, a room full of drummers going, yeah, that's that sounds that sounds yeah. great because you want to work with the musicians. I want to be. I want to be a great musician. With the Iggy gig, the MD, who's a friend of mine as well, Kevin, he, he all he was really cared about with my drum kit was the sound of the snare drum. Mm. If the if the snare drum wasn't right, and we spent a lot of time getting the right one, and I'm I'm using it now, which is it's a Ludwig Legacy snare drum. Um, if that snare drum wasn't right, as far as he's concerned, you know, the band sounded fifty percent less less good because you hear that snare drum, yeah. and if the snare drum sounds good, then everything else can, yeah. can build around that. So that, that's from an, a, a world-class musical director. What yeah. advice would you give your younger self then? Um, well, that's a good one. I think in terms of um, the insecurity of being a professional musician, 
I would have said to my younger self, try not to worry about that. Um, because I have spent a number of, you know, a, a lot of wasted time worrying about that over the years. And it's proved to be much less of a worry than I'd imagined. If you, if you concentrate on your skills and concentrate on being able to interact with other people in a professional way or even a friendly way or just be a good guy, if you can, then people will want you. You know, you'll find something to do. Somebody will want you. And there's always, there's always lean times as a professional musician. There are always times when there's no money and you don't know where your next job is coming from and all that. But I would have said to my younger self, don't worry about that. Just as long as you love it and you keep doing it, it will be okay. And so it's proved so far. Um, don't be in too much of a hurry. Uh, because I, when I was younger, it always felt like the clock was ticking. Um, it's that the idea that somehow if I get to the age, if I get to the age of 20, I'll be old and past it. It's that kind of thing. Well, when you're young, you know, and, uh, you know, from 14, 20 is old. And then when you get to 20, 40, you know, on it goes 30 is old, 40, the benchmark moves along. I didn't think I would be doing music at the age of 52 uh, with the success that I've had at the age of 52. So, yeah, don't be too. The, the clock isn't ticking because there are artists of all ages working on things. And I like the idea that um, some musicians just get better with age. Like, for example, you say Johnny Cash, incredible career as a throughout turbulent times. You know, the man certainly lived his thing, and towards the end, his voice has kind of kind of come down to this uh, kind of wise croak. But what a croak! You know, it's got it's got all those years and experience distilled into that sound. I like the idea that um, my voice has um, changed as well as I've got older. Um, I like to hear the sound of uh, age working its way about me, and uh, it's, I, li I like that. I like that. I like to hear that. Don't be too hard on yourself, and uh, go to bed early, get up early, uh, rather than the opposite way around. I would have told my younger self to believe it would have actually been possible to make something of music, because I spent all my time doing it, but I had such self-doubt as to whether this would go anywhere that I didn't really do anything about it other than make a lot of it. And that's the most important thing, is to make a lot of music. I sometimes meet, meet, meet young people who've made three tracks and they want to make it big, and I'm thinking, well, maybe try at least 60 tracks first and then, <laughs> then we can talk about that. But um, I, I, would, I would have advised myself to have a bit more confidence, yeah. uh, not arrogance, but just a bit more confidence in the possibilities. Yeah. Because there's so many ways you can uh, go through the musical path today. It doesn't just have to be being a rock star, obviously. I'd have played with more people because I was in a band and it had a management that said, right, you can only play in this band and you're not allowed to play with anybody. And I had people like Courtney Pine asking me to play in his band. And I was saying no. Do you know what I mean? He must have thought I was completely nuts. Like, why would I say no to playing in his band? But it wasn't me saying no, it was my management saying no. Yeah. And um, in a way it did work because everybody was intrigued by our band because like no one would really play outside the band. It was just, you could only see us as a band. But it didn't work because then I didn't get the chance to experience playing with people like Courtney Pine and Master, who are masters at what they do, and being out of my depth, you know? Because, I mean, I, I know I was playing complicated stuff and, and Courtney came to a few of our gigs as well. But he, for me, he was a master. He'd been doing it much longer than us, do you know what I mean? And if I just, I don't even know if I ended up doing a gig with him later on because someone broke the rules in the band eventually anyway <laughs> and then and <laughs> once he'd done doing. that and then everybody was just like well if you can do it Free I'm doing it yeah yeah I would have just learned so much of him you know what I mean and there would be there were so many other people that I could have learned of if I just you know played in their band and played with them do you know what I mean what sort of period of a length of time was that going on for that was only when I was in quite sane that's when we was like I don't know between 18 and in our 1820s okay kind of time and um yeah so uh yeah that was the rule do you know what i mean you can't play in any other bands it's a stupid rule do you know what i mean it's just rubbish so if i could go back and talk to talk to my younger self i, I think i would just be um i would just be reassurance rather than advice um you know i've been doing this for a long time and it's only in the last five or six years that there's really been any success um, to speak of in terms of, um, you know, audience acclaim, 
um, record sales and ticket sales and, and those kind of um, uh, things that are um, you know, practical or you know, uh, success in a sort of practical terms. Um, so I, w I would say, yeah, just, just, you know, just keep doing what you're doing and, and do more of it um, and keep at it because you know, you, you, it, you, it can come to you at a later stage in your life. It doesn't always come to the, to the youngsters. And probably the other bit of advice I'd give would be to do, do more shows, you know, stick, you know, work harder at your musicianship because those are, I think I would have enjoyed the, the live shows that we have done a little bit more. They'd have been less stressful for me if, um, you know, I'd have just kind of uh, worked a bit harder on the, uh, you know, on the, uh, on the, the instrumental side of things. So, so the, yeah, those two bits of advice. Mm. Yeah, would she have listened? <laughs> <laughs> would she have listened to me? <laughs> um, I would have said probably just enjoy it more, actually. Yeah. Enjoy the process. Because there is a lot, there's such an emphasis in classical music on discipline and practice. And, and I actually think that's quite destructive to kids. Um, I think actually what's really valuable is to practice regularly. Mm -hmm. And even if it's only five minutes a day, that's far more valuable than doing 30 minutes at the end of the week. Okay. Because you pick it up and you, you put your chin on it, you make something, you do a noise, and then you get, you find you do five minutes and you know, you put it away. Mm -hmm. But you get used to picking it up, putting it down, getting into that position. Um, I think that's more valuable than doing it all at the end of the week just before your lesson, which often happens as well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's interesting because if I, I, I could sort of say that uh, could advise myself to practice more uh, because I didn't practice enough to be able to play such wonderful pieces of music. But if I had practiced more, I wouldn't have then developed some of those other skills that I have which allow me to be more free in when I'm writing music now. I can Im improvise and I can just move around and, and make something that I'm playing straight away it's probably sound like it's something that's been written carefully. But I wouldn't have that if I, if I hadn't sort of been messing around playing Barry Manilow and, <laughs> and all those, those weird songs. Um, so I, I think uh, maybe a little bit more practice would have been good. That would have been better at what I do, uh, but not too much. Um, I think, um, I mean, outside music as well, um, I think as a younger as a younger self, when I was just leaving college, starting off in the industry, I think we're, I think we're all a little, little bit guilty of being super eager, super keen, and oh, oh I can do that, you know, oh I could be, I'm, 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 I could do that better than he does that, and you know he's an established musician who's been there ten years, and yeah. so probably sound, you're always on the border of sounding a little bit possibly arrogant even, yeah. but it's really just enthusiasm. So, in a way, um, possibly just. A bit more diplomacy every now and again, uh, just a little bit less sort of. I can't do that, you know. But it's a tough one though because you've got to be brave enough to knock on doors and, and want to sort of get in there with all these people. And if you're going to just sit back and admire them and, and not put yourself forward saying that I can do that, then you're never going to get in either. So yeah. there's, there's a lot of fine lines um, in the industry. Keep open to all styles. I think I may have been a little bit narrow when I was younger. Uh, you know, I was so obsessed with rock and it would took me a, a longer time to start exploring other genres. So I definitely say that. Um, I'm not in the technology age now. So, um, you know, that, 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 that therein lies a bit of a difference because I'd advise someone now to, to be a self-learner. But I guess I was a self-learner. Yeah, I was a self-learner. I used tapes and stuff like that. Keeping more of an open mind uh, in regards to... And practice, you know, practice on a regular basis, even if it's just for five minutes a day or ten minutes a day. Yeah, they're the sort of things I realise. Networking is everything. Um, you can be absolutely amazing, um, but if you don't network, you're not going to get very far. Um, but if you do all the networking, but then you don't have the skills to back it up, then you're going to get found out. Um, so it's a fine line, you know. Um, there are people that network amazingly and they have a, a lot of talent, but then there are people that got more talent that don't have the networking skills that don't get anywhere near as far. Yeah. Myself, I would put myself probably in the latter category. I've never been a great networker, 
to be honest. Um, but I've been quite fortunate that I haven't really needed to be because uh, for 25 years I've been working on all these wonderful pantomime productions as a musical supervisor, arranger, and that has been like a, a wonderful security blanket of income for a start. So, and then I just cherry pick other things around it. So having to network hasn't necessarily, I've not had to network to go and try and find new contacts to bring new jobs in. But a lot of people don't have the luxury of that. So to those people, I would say yes. Learn how to, you know, how to network without being too insistent. Having said that, the person who was accused of being arrogant with his letter, <laughs> you've got to, you've got to knock on doors. You have to knock on doors. You've got to start somewhere. I started by just going down to the Palace Theatre and knocking on the door and saying, oh, sorry, could I, could I just see, you know, find out who's, who plays the keyboards? I found out who played the keyboards. I, I waited for them at the stage door and I introduced myself and I said, can I come and sit in and watch? And they said, well, yeah, yeah. And um, we're not looking for anybody at the moment. I said, OK, oh, I'd love to come and watch. So I watched the show and uh, then about four weeks later, uh, they rang me up because I left my number. It's a couple of our deputies have got permanent jobs. We're looking for another deputy in our pool of deputies. Would you like to come in and learn it now? So I did, and then that was, and then it snowballed from there. But that's you've got to, got to go and knock on the door and, and make that first step. I, I spoke to earlier on about the music business so, being somewhere out there. Well. There is no Golden Castle anymore. It, it, there might have been in the 70s or some. I don't know. But, um, but there isn't any Golden Castle. There's not one place that is a music industry. Like we're now, we're, you know, the, the three of us as we're making this move, we, we are sitting in the music industry. We're at Real World Studios. When I'm sitting in my house writing music, you know, I'm in the music industry. <laughs> That's what I do. So what, basically, you know, when you're working in music, you are working in the music industry. You are working in the business of music. Yeah. Um, be brave. Listen to lots of stuff. Um, take the good of any criticism that gets thrown at you and work with it. Um, don't get downhearted when it fails because you'll learn a lot more from something that goes wrong. You know, in, it, you can learn, learn a hell of a lot from those sort of things. It's great when things go right, of course, but you know, you know, failure does have its. Uh, you know, you, you pick yourself up and you dust yourself down and keep moving on. Um, be curious about sound. Um, pass on what you know and what you've learned to other musicians as you meet them, uh, because they're, they're on a similar journey to you. Um, being a musician is, uh, it's quite a tricky life. Uh, it's, not the easy, it's not the most um, smoothest of paths, and, and it's not for the faint hearted. And uh, basically believe in the music you're making and, uh, and, and just keep going, just keep doing it. Just do it because you, you love it and hopefully the love that you put into your music, other people will pick up on that. And um, be authentic when you write something. Uh, do it with your whole being, you know, put your whole, um, the whole of yourself into what you do and, and, uh, and care. Like, you know, th just do the best you can with what you've got at the time as well. And just keep going, keep going. That's it. That was like my school, they, they forced us, but it was a good school, the London Oratory, oh, nice plug. <laughs> <laughs> yeah.